presentation i request dr rajeshri patil madam to give brief introduction about dr ml gatte sir patil madam please thank you dr vaidya uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker uh, dr mukulesh lakshman gatne uh, i have been also in association with uh, sir uh, for last 22 years so it's my pleasure sir uh, dr mukulesh uh, gatne has uh, held various positions which includes a research assistant for 3 years assistant professor for 8 years and associate professor for again 8 years also he had been a professor of department of veterinary parasitology for 10 years and he has worked as a university head for 5 years and he has also looked after the duties of registrar of maharashtra animal and fishery sciences university for 2 months and he voluntarily retired on 16 november 2017 as professor and head of department of veterinary parasitology from mumbai veterinary college uh, mahatu nagpur uh, in his academic contribution he has been taught for 31 batches of undergraduate bvsc and uh, ed students he has guided 17 mvsc students and one phd student he has been worked as a chairman of board of studies veterinary parasitology at mapsu nagpur he has been a uh, paper setter and evaluator for ug pg and phd degree programs for several universities in mm. india uh, he has been worked as a external examiner for masters and doctoral phd thesis uh, he has got uh, three awards as best teacher and he played a key role in starting phd by course work in veterinary parasitology in maharashtra mapsu nagpur he has been actively involved and he has a uh, uh, active role in number of academic committees for regulatory refinement and uh, amendments uh, in addition to academic contribution uh, dr gatne sir is having also a strong research background and contribution in which he has been published uh, 73 uh, international and national uh, uh, 73 uh, research publication in national and international peer reviewed journals he has been uh, published uh, he has been contributed three chapters in uh, in books and uh, two uh, scientific booklets in icci he has been published uh, he has uh, presented uh, papers as a lead paper in international conferences in three international conferences and eight uh, national conferences and a three in medical conferences and uh, contributory paper uh, he has been presented in 72 conferences uh, he has a international collaborative project he has worked as a uh, principal and co principal investigator in the international collaborative three projects with australia and germany uh, he and also he has been a uh, investigator in national icci pro two projects i industry sponsored 11 projects he has established molecular parasitology lab in mumbai veterinary college he discovered new species of wild carnivore hookworm golankas ramon honey ramon honey so this is a very uh, very renowned and very uh, very important contribution and discovery by gatne uh, sir so again in addition to research background also he has been worked as an extension worker and he has uh, published uh, 12 extension article he has been uh, given uh, involved in uh, five television programs and uh, uh, 39 radio programs he has uh, uh, delivered lectures in training programs for uh, for practicing vet in uh, various uh, 16 programs and uh, also he has uh, lecture in pharma companies 24 pharma companies and uh, six uh, uh, field camps and also he has been involved in uh, webinars during covid 18 covid pan 18 webinars in covid pandemics uh, in addition to again uh, extension work he has been a very uh, very good administrative worker also so his administrative contribution uh, involved uh, includes uh, professor and head for uh, 10 years university head for 5 years campus in charge of uh, gorigao mumbai veterinary college 3 years 
he has uh, been a registrar in Maksu for two months, chief counselor for two years, academic in charge for three years, and member of academic council of, uh, of Maksu for five years. He has also international recognition wherein he worked the meeting on the number, of followed by pound of University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, he has been a, a representative a representative member of India of Asia Pacific Forum on Canine Vector Born Diseases, CVBD, for six years. He has been founder member of Tropical Council uh, for Companion Animal Parasitology, uh, Australia. And uh, he has been uh, uh, affiliated with various professional uh, professional associations, which include the FIU Professional Association, and he is a registered member of the state veterinary association. So all participants are requested to be muted. Other, con uh, other professional contributions include Executive Member of Federation of Small Animal Practitioner Association of India, Vice President of Indian Association of uh, Advancement of Veterinary Parasitology, Member of Editorial Board of Journal of Veterinary Parasitology. He worked as uh, Editor of uh, Pet Practitioner Association of Mumbai Bulletin for three years. Uh, he worked as an assistant editor of uh, Journal of Bombay Veterinary College Alumina Association for three years. He worked as an executive member of PPAM for three years, organizing secretary for two national level conferences, uh, that is National Congress of Veterinary Parasitology in 2011, and field body program and use of uh, simulation model in veterinary ed education in 2013. Uh, he has been invited, uh, he had been invited as an expert in veterinary parasitology for recruitment of academic staff by a number of universities, invited as paper sitter and interview panelist by ASRP New Delhi, small animal practice. The lady, probably his wife, uh, had a punching remarks that, Are bhai, ye khana ab kitni der thanda ho jayega, jaldi khalo, aur ye telephone pe jo bug bug chal rahi ho, ban kar do. <laughs> So, jokes apart, please, uh, this is a sincere request to all the participants that uh, you mute yourself. Of course, at the end of the webinar, you will get adequate chance to express yourself. So, I am very eager to answer your queries. Thank you very much. So, let me begin with my presentation now. And this is by default uh, the template of my first uh, slide in every presentation. The building, what you are seeing in the picture, is the office or administrative building of a Bombay Veterinary College. This is the place where the foundation stone of veterinary education was laid down way back in 1886. So the college is around 132 years old. It is like a mother institute to number of other veterinary colleges, research stations, animal husbandry departments. And that is how I feel very proud to be alumnus of such a great institute. And in fact, you know, anything for the institute, because when Dr. Vaidya called me offering this particular lecture, uh, I almost immediately said yes, because whatever, you know, if I get a chance to do for my college, it is always a pleasure to, uh, in doing so. So with a tribute to my college, my alma mater, I would like to begin my presentation. The topic uh, which was given to me is a zoonotic importance of Echinococcus and its economic impact. So, hydatidosis or cystic echinococcus is a parasitic cyst. It is a condition where the parasitic cyst is formed in the visceral organs of uh, herbivores like cattle, buffalo, sheep, goat, camel, horses, omnivores like pigs. And accidentally, human beings are also infected with a hydatid disease. Now, the visceral organs means their condition is commonly detected in uh, lungs, in liver, less frequently in spleen, kidney, and other visceral organs also. If you go through the literature and see the occurrences of uh, hydatidosis with respect to its localization in the host, you will find that it has been reported from almost all types of organs, 
So I would say no organ has been exempted from the attack of uh, hydatidosis. So that is how the hydatid cysts are formed. Uh, those who are working in the slaughterhouses or the pathologists involved in conducting necropsy or a postmortem on a regular basis would know that uh, these hydatid cysts uh, ranges from as small as peanut to as big as a football size. Uh, when I was working for my MBSC PhD and also when I was working like a guide for number of students where we used to visit uh, the uh, slaughterhouse or the abattoir. Bombay has got the biggest abattoir of the country where large number of animals are slaughtered on a daily basis. So I had myself recovered one hydrated cyst uh, weighing around 7.5 kg containing 5.5 liters of hydrated fluid from the liver of a bull. The same animal also had a big hydrated cyst in the spleen. So when I looked at the carcass which was hanging on a conveyor belt, I did not find much difference in the carcass. So it was like any other carcass. So in spite of the big hydrated cyst in the liver and in spleen, the carcass was, it was rather astonishing for me, but that I had recovered. Now this mostly hydrated cyst is filled with a fluid called as hydrated fluid. Occasionally, you will find it is containing a cheesy, caseous material or it may contain a pus, depending upon the age of the hydrated cyst. This hydrated cyst uh, survives in the body of the infected animals from few months to few years. And then over a period of time, as the age of the cyst advances gradually, then it regresses and occasionally it is then calcified, particularly in cattle and uh, buffalo. Then as you can see here in this picture also, if you see the structure of a hydatid cyst, this is the outermost layer which is formed by the host tissues. Then there is a laminated layer which is formed by the parasite and this pinkish is a germinal layer and uh, that is the wall of the hydatid cyst. Occasionally, there may be a daughter hydatid cyst. Now this daughter hydatid cyst may develop either in the cavity of a main hydatid cyst or it may come out from the cyst wall. So it may be exogenous or it may be endogenous uh, daughter cyst. And then the innermost layer is called as a germinal layer and to which the number of uh, uh, small protoscoleses are attached. Sometimes, these protoscoleses are also enclosed in a very thin membranous uh, capsule-like structure, which is known as a brood capsule, okay? So that is how the structure of hydrated cyst is. But now let me tell you at this point of time that uh, every hydrated cyst does not develop all these uh, internal structures. You may come across certain hydrated cyst devoid of all these structures. So on that basis, whether these structures are present or absent, on that basis, the hydatid cyst can be categorized as a fertile hydatid cyst when all those protoscoleses and brood capsules are present, it is called as a fertile hydatid cyst. And if these structures are not present, that means there is only the wall and fluid inside, that's it. No other structures are there. Then that particular cyst is called as sterile cyst. Needless to say, only fertile cyst can propagate in the nature. Even if the sterile cyst is consumed by the appropriate final host, the life cycle does not pro proceed. It gets interrupted because the sterile hydatid cyst does not have the propagative power. Only the fertile hydatid cyst has a propagative power because it contains a protoscoleses. So as I've said, there is a hydatid fluid and uh, this hydrated fluid is uh, biochemically very, very similar to the serum of that particular host. What I mean here that all the components which are found in the serum of the host are also present in the hydrated fluid. Because as I've said uh, that the hydrated cyst wall is formed by the participation of not only parasite but also the host. Now during that phase, certain of the host proteins are also get incorporated in the hydrated fluid. 
Okay, so that is the structure of, or uh, that is the biochemical composition of hydrated fluid. And for this particular reason, this uh, hydrated fluid is uh, attracted by most of the research workers in order to find out what are the different antigens of uh, echinococcus and hydrated in the uh, immunological book. So brood capsules, I've already mentioned protoscolosis. Sometimes what happens, these brood capsules and protoscolosis get detached from the wall or from the germinal layer and float free in the fluid. And when you cut up... Uh, then when you cut open the hydrated cyst and take the fluid in uh, the glass container, then you can see white particles in that and that is referred as hydrated sand. So this is actually the structure of hydrated cyst or cross morphological features of a hydrated cyst and uh, its contents. Now, as uh, most of you know that uh, this is a larval stage. It is also called as a metacystode. Okay, so this is a larval stage of a cystode called echinococcus. There are different species of echinococcus occurring in different parts of the world. So it is a tapeworm which is residing in the small intestine of dog. And uh, the larval stage is called as hydatid cyst, which develops in the different visceral organ. Now see the fun here that uh, echinococcus species is the smallest tapeworm of dog. Hardly it is 2 to 5 millimeters or 2 to 7 millimeters in length containing uh, 2 to 4 segments. But it is giving rise to largest larval stage of the cystode and that is hydrated cyst. The species which are occurring worldwide are Echinococcus granulosus which is the most common species. Then Echinococcus multilocularis, Echinococcus vogelii and Echinococcus oligarthus. Echinococcus multilocularis is the most pathogenic species of uh, Echinococcus because uh, when the hydrated cyst is formed, uh, generally it is formed in rodents, but when human beings are uh, uh, affected, then the cysts are formed in the liver and it grows like a malignant tumor. It invades through the tissues and it is a very, very serious condition in human beings. Uh, we Indians are fortunate not to have this particular species in our country. There are one or two reports, if I recollect very faintly, from Kashmir region, but otherwise this species doesn't occur in India. Echinococcus vogelii and Echinococcus oligarthus are the species uh, which uh, are uh, propagating in the sylvatic cycles and these two species also do not occur in India. So as far as our country is concerned, uh, Echinococcus granulosus is the only species occurring uh, here. Now, even though there is only one species occurring in India, uh, researchers have identified a different uh, biotypes because in the earlier period when I was doing my master's or PhD, those molecular tools were not available. In fact, you know, we could see some of the references and it used to appear like some extraterrestrial work. So molecular tools were uh, not easily available. So in those days, these different strains were identified on the basis of biology depending upon which intermediate host is involved in the cycle, whether it is a sylvatic cycle, synanthropic cycle, or an urban cycle. And then uh, there were also few uh, morphological differences. Obviously, these differences were not so distinct or obvious, but people have attempted morphological differences in the different strains. But as we all know that uh, in the present century or at the beginning of the 21st century, the molecular, molecular tools uh, uh, become available and then in most of the laboratories, the molecular work was carried out. And with the advent of molecular techniques, then people also started uh, investigating uh, the hydrated cysts from different hosts, from different regions, from sylvatic cycle and the other cycles. Uh, by using a molecular tools. And then 
generally the conserved uh, dean uh, uh, conserved uh, dna was utilized for this particular purpose associated with either mitochondria or nucleus to know what are the different types of uh, genotypes available in different regions so these are called as the genotypes as you can see here in the table in the first column you will have different genotype that is g1 to g10 okay so these are the different designations of course depending upon the most uh, common species of intermediate host involved in that particular genotype the stains are also designated as a common sheep stain for g1 then tasmanian sheep stain for g2 buffalo stain for g3 equine stain for g4 uh, cattle stain for g5 camel stain for g6 then pig strain for G7, G8 and G10 are the cervid stains, and G9 is a human strain. Of course, you know, we do not know the final host for this particular strain. So depending on that, uh, these designations were used. In the third column, you can see the intermediate host from which these uh, genotypes were identified. Now, in the table, you will find certain uh, words which are uh, printed in red. Those are the strains which have been reported from India. So as far as India is concerned, G1, G2, G3, these are very closely related genotypes. In fact, uh, in the literature, it has been categorized as a species called as Echinococcus granulosus sensu stricto. So one species containing three different genotypes which are very closely associated with each other. And then uh, we also have a G5 in India. Now, if you look at the zoonotic link, of course, the uh, substantial work uh, on the zoonotic link is still lacking. But as you can see here, in this, uh, the common sheep strain is found to be zoonotic. There are certain contradicting references about Tasmanian sheep strain, whether it is a zoonotic or not, that is not... Uh, fully known uh, then buffalo stain is not is non-zoonotic no uh, human hydrated cases uh, have been identified as a g3 yet and uh, equine strain is again non-zoonotic while other strains are zoonotic so the strains uh, or the genotype which are occurring in india g1 g2 g3 and g5 you will find out of that you know there are reports from India regarding G1, G2, particularly from the northeastern region by Bhattacharya et al. And our Gudevar has also done excellent work on that. G3 has been reported. We have carried out certain work in our laboratory. Dr. Riddhi Pednekar did her master's research on this particular topic and conducted a very wonderful work. Then G5 also uh, is occurring in India. So these uh, species are occurring in India. And now as uh, the work has continued on these aspects, now people are uh, categorizing them as a different species. As I've already said, G1, G2, G3, uh, these are considered as the genotypes of Echinococcus granulosus sensu stricto. Then equine strain, there is a proposal of a new name called Echinococcus equinus. As far as the cattle strain is concerned, it has been almost accepted by most of the scientists, a new name, species name for this, and that is Echinococcus ortlepi. And one peculiar feature of Echinococcus ortlepi is that uh, these cysts are uh, 90 to 95 percent of the cysts are formed only in lungs. Okay, these cysts do not occur in other visceral organs. Uh, so that is the peculiarity of G5 or Echinococcus ortlepi. Then cervid stain is also now uh, identified as a separate species of Echinococcus canadensis. And there is one Echinococcus which has been reported from felix lion. Okay, so this is the 11th uh, type that has uh, been reported in the literature. So these are the workers who have done a wonderful uh, work on the molecular analysis of uh, echinococcus in India. So uh, let me tell you about the work which uh, we carried out at Bombay Veterinary College uh, way back in 2008. 
and it has been published in the International Journal of Veterinary Parasitology having a very high impact factor. And in this particular work, uh, we tried to correlate the molecular features with the morphological features. As we all know that the molecular tools cannot be used every now and then. It is pretty expensive. But uh, that is why we wanted to establish a correlation between the molecular genotypes and the morphological features. To some extent, we were successful in that. But again, that is not very obvious so that you can identify these genotypes on the basis of morphology. So this study consists of uh, the examination of the carcasses in the Mumbai slaughterhouse for a period of almost one year and more than four to 5,000 animals were examined and the hydatid cysts were collected. And uh, the hydatid cysts were then subjected to the molecular analysis and the 40 hydatid cysts. So each uh, hydatid cyst represent each animal. We haven't collected two hydatid cysts from the same animal. So 40 animals infected with hydatid cysts and we did a molecular analysis of that. Not only that, we also at the end of the molecular analysis, we retrieved the, uh, the amplified uh, factor or the amplicon and then we did a two-way uh, sequencing to identify the exact genotype by constructing a phylogenetic tree. And you will find that these strains were reported uh, in the hydatid cyst uh, from the animals those were slaughtered at Bombay. Let me tell you at this point of time that Bombay has a biggest abattoir and then the animals from 10 to 12 different states come here for the slaughter. So it is not only the picture of Maharashtra, it is uh, the picture of 10 to 12 adjacent states also. And in that, you will find here, if you concentrate on the last column, you will find that 62.5% of the hydrated uh, uh, cysts had a genotype G3, that is a buffalo strain. And this was recorded in cattle also, buffalo also, sheep and uh, pigs. So this was found to be the most common uh, genotype in this part of uh, India, then followed by cattle, which is now uh, identified as Echinococcus ortlepi in 20% of the cases, and then the common sheep strain, and uh, only two cases which were found only in cattle, not in the other host of a Tasmanian. Uh, so these were the different molecular types to be recorded. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the most exhaustive study till date. So it has a very importance of that. Now, let me, let me, let me come to the life cycle or uh, the transmission dynamics of the kind of focus. As we all know, Doctor, sir, please. Uh, Dr. Rahul. Shanke, please keep your, please be muted. Dr. Rahul. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys. So, if you look at the transmission cycle, this is the development in the animals. What is happening here that the dog is infected with Echinococcus granulosus, which resides in the small intestine, and then the eggs are voided in the feces. So these eggs are responsible for the environmental contamination. The eggs have a very thick wall and uh, these eggs are resistant to different types of disinfectants and even to the adverse climatic conditions. And that is why they can survive or persist for a pretty long time in the nature, maybe for a few months. Maybe for a few months they can survive. And that is a source of infection for the herbivores animals or the omnivores. So once the environment is contaminated with the eggs of Echinococcus granulosus, it remains contaminated for a pretty long time. So as we all know that herbivores are basically grazing animals. So while grazing on the contaminated pasture or contaminated land, they acquire the infection by consuming eggs of Echinococcus granulosus. 
then in the body of these intermediate host the eggs hatch and the oncospheres these are the larval stages are released in the small intestine and then via blood circulation they are disseminated in different parts of the body where they develop into a cyst called as a hydatid cyst most commonly you will find the hydatid cyst in the lung and liver and uh, at the other places also so this is the normal transmission okay which is happening in animals from carnivores to herbivores or omnivores and from omnivores to carnivores and human beings are accidentally involved in this transmission human beings can acquire infection by consuming eggs of echinococcus through contamination of food and water or even if the hands are contaminated then these eggs can survive under side of the nails for pretty long time so that is how they acquire infection even we have noticed that the eggs of echinococcus are also present in the fur so after handling the dog you know that is a source for human being for uh, echinococcus granulosus so mind it well that human beings are infected only by consuming eggs of echinococcus the fertile hydatid cyst or the hydatid cyst even if it is inadvertently consumed by human being it is a, the, the then the parasite has no fate in human being so the infection cannot establish infection can establish only by consumption of uh, eggs of echinococcus and invariably it happens through contamination of feed and water so that is how human beings accidentally acquire the infection so during the natural course of infection where the life cycle is alternating between the carnivorous final host and herbivorous intermediate host human beings are accidentally involved now let me talk about the features of animal hydatidosis then we will discuss about uh, human hydatidosis then we will consider the uh, clinical entity of human hydatidosis and the zoonotic and uh, economic importance so as we all know that it is ubiquitously distributed throughout india so india is considered as endemic for hydatidosis but uh, uh most of this majority of these cases i would say 99.99% of the cases are asymptomatic where no classical symptoms are exhibited by these intermediate host and these infections are long lasting as i have already mentioned that the hydatid cyst survive in the body of the intermediate host in the visceral organs for a few years and invariably since there are no symptoms these cases are not presented to the veterinarian for the diagnosis and these cases are invariably detected during the slaughter or during the necropsy so it is like a accidental detection then uh, as i have said predominantly you will find the hydatid cyst in the lung and liver and then less frequently in spleen heart kidney so on and so forth now if you look at the percentage of the fertility rate of the hydatid cyst that means the hydatid cyst containing those of protoscolosis and brood capsule you will find that the fertility rate is highest in sheep that means around 90 to 95% of the hydatid cyst that are present in the body of sheep are fertile cyst containing those protoscolosis and brood capsules around 60% of the pigs are uh, having a fertile sex while in cattle and buffaloes hardly 20 to 25% of the cysts are fertile cysts so as far as the propagation of the parasite in the nature is concerned you will find sheep is playing very important role population wise pig population is distinctly less than sheep so the sheep is having a uh, fertile cyst more and that is why sheep plays a very important role in the propagation of the parasite in an endemic area if you look at the intensity uh, you can interpret the int intensity by two ways one is a size wise intensity that is the size of the hydatid cyst and second the number of hydatid cysts present in the body of the same individual so if you look at the intensity of the hydatid cyst size wise it is highest in buffalo that means the average size of the hydatid cyst is 
highest in or the hydrated cyst is biggest largest in buffaloes followed by cattle followed by pig and followed by sheep on an average the size of the hydrated cyst is like a like a table tennis ball so around 4 to 5 cm in diameter now if you consider number wise intensity you will find very interestingly that the order is precisely opposite the numbers are more in sheep once the sheep is infected you will find there are two three four cysts in the same individual followed by pig then cattle and then buffalo now this is something related with the immune status of the host in case of a sheep i think the parasite is uh, uh, well adapted and that is why the parasite doesn't come across the hostile immunological reaction in sheep and that is why you will find more number of uh, cysts in sheep once it is infected and a more number of fertile cysts while in cattle and buffalo the immunity because this uh, evolutionary relation between cattle and buffalo and the parasite may be of a recent nature so probably there is a hostile reaction and that is why you will see one or two cysts in the body of the infected animals of course this is uh, uh, not a rule but the this is the observation what we have recorded so far during our experience in working slaughter house now if you consider the economic losses or economic importance of hydrated cysts so obviously the direct losses are because of the condemnation of the edible offals like liver lung and spleen and kidney uh, and also you know of, uh, by downgrading the quality of the these offals so that is a direct losses the indirect losses is a weight loss then loss of production uh, like milk production meat production so on and so forth of course it is very difficult to assess the indirect losses but the direct losses you can assess and uh, uh, quite a few references are available in the literature as far as uh, this aspect is concerned now coming to the prevalence of hydatidosis uh, i would like to because you know as i have said in the beginning that there are number of references available in the available literature particularly in the indian literature so uh, you know when we were uh, doing a thesis on molecular types of uh, echinococcus in the animals that are slaughtered in mumbai we did a review of uh, the literature and we tried to find out the trend of uh, incidence or a prevalence and uh, from this particular chart you will appreciate that gradually the prevalence uh, is declining now this is a period from 1980 to 19 1991 to 20 so decade wise and of course this thesis was uh, uh, published in 2008 so up to 2008 you will find in most of the cases the prevalence is on a decline gradually it is declining uh, somewhat you know in the west region the figures are not matching but i have got one more plate where Uh, we have worked uh, that means department of veterinary parasitology and the uh, department of food hygiene uh, have worked on prevalence of hydatidosis and other bladder worms in the animals that uh, were slaughtered in mumbai and uh, in this case also you will find that uh, the prevalence is gradually declining okay so this is my mbc work then this is my phd work then uh, dr pednekar worked for her mbc then I, we had uh, some icr scheme in our department and this is a very very elaborate work uh, by the etal they have carried out uh, uh, for four to five years from 2011 to 2016 and 17 and it has been published in a very good journal uh, i think i have got a picture of that also so you can appreciate here that uh, the prevalence is gradually declining so no doubt uh, hydatidosis is a age old condition occurring in india and uh, while going through the literature i came across a very interesting reference by gayatri ital in 2021 very recent what she did or the authors did uh, the meta analysis of the reports of hydatidosis published in journal from 1980 to 
by there is some uh, you know software available so by using that to find out the pooled prevalence of hydatidosis in cattle buffalo sheep goat and pigs so the pool prevalence was found to be 15 13 6 5 and 3 percent respectively in these animals find it well this is a pool prevalence i am pretty sure more than confident that uh, the prevalence was higher at the beginning of this period and it uh, went on reducing uh, at the end of this particular period so that is also evident by the previous slide here and this is the extensive work now uh, let me tell you that here you will find the number of animals this these all were annual studies in fact vaidya et al did it for 5 to 6 years consecutively and if you see the number of animals examined in all these species wise every species we have examined more than 1000 animals and vaidya et al they have examined more than 50000 animals during the entire period so that is how the trend what we have got that it is gradually declining then coming to the features of human hydatidosis uh, uh, there are sporadic reports of human hydatidosis then uh, when we were uh, discussing about the zoonotic aspect of uh, echinococcosis while writing the thesis uh, uh, petnecker et al so there we came across Uh, some references stating that the the cases of hydatidosis is 500 cases reported from india from 1960 to 2010 so in 50 years 500 cases so on an average 10 cases per year and considering the population of india of more than 100 million this is very very uh, negligible so that is how you know the cases that have been reported subsequently after 2010 you know there are there are some of the interesting reports in rajasthan andhra pradesh and tamil nadu in rajasthan by mathur et al in 2016 where in a period of 6 years from 2010 to 2015 155 cases were recorded in tamil nadu again uh, sangaran et al they did some retro analysis of the data and they found that there are 62 cases were reported Uh, for a period of 4 uh, to 5 years so on an average 10 cases per year in a population of more than 100 million so that prevalence or the in, uh, uh, zoonotic significance is uh, comparatively low what i mean to say because there are sporadic reports of hydatidosis of course you know it all depends upon the socio economic uh, uh, conditions of the country also in a country like india where there are number of other emerging and reemerging zoonoses comparatively the status of hydatid has remained uh, same as far as the human cases are concerned while in animals it is on a decline now if you look at the clinical uh, entity of human hydatidosis they acquire accidentally by ingestion of eggs of echinococcus cyst develop gradually and there are two types of cyst primary cyst and secondary cyst primary cyst like what happens in animal secondary means you know invariably while performing a surgery if the cyst ruptures in the body while doing a surgery then those protoscolocysts which spill over they can go and attach to the abdominal wall or a peritoneal wall and then they develop into hydatid cyst which is called as a secondary hydatid or a disseminated hydatidosis okay then uh, invariably these cases are associated with symptoms as i've said in animal the symptoms are not there but here the symptoms are uh, predominantly seen there could be anaphylaxis uh, sudden deaths due to rupture of hydatid cyst resulting into anaphylaxis may happen because uh, when the hydatid cyst is being formed there are frequent breaches and the hydatid fluid leakage of hydatid fluid and that is how the host is sensitized to hydatid antigens and occasionally there may be anaphylaxis then there are few reports about the internal drowning that means if a big cyst is developing in the lung and if it ruptures then there is aspiration and death can happen the otherwise the symptoms are uh, dependent on the localization of the hydatid cyst and intensity in liver also there is uh, abdominal pain 
there may be vomiting malaise in case of pulmonary hydatidosis there is a chest pain and cough so depending upon the symptom uh, location you will find different symptoms diagnosis in human being is basically by imaging technique serology can be used but by doing serology one wouldn't know the location of the hydatidosis because diagnosis is done with the with an with the with the objective of performing surgery so for surgery one should know the location of the hydatid cyst so imaging techniques like uh, ultrasonography ct scan and other imaging techniques mri are uh, done and the treatment is a surgical treatment of course there are few references about heavy doses of albendazole and praziquantel acting on hydatidosis but that is purely for academic interest then uh, when you are considering a zoonotic risk of uh, hydatidosis uh, let me tell you here uh, very honestly and frankly that the prevalence of echinococcosis in dogs should be considered okay we should not consider the prevalence of hydatidosis in food animal as an indicator for the zoonotic risk i have seen some of the articles where the prevalence of hydatidosis is reflected as the magnitude of zoonotic risk for human being and that is in my sincere opinion is a error rather than that one should work on the prevalence of echinococcosis in dogs because that is the source of infection now i have a reasons to say so why because all hydatid cysts are not propagators as we all know that cattle and buffaloes 80% of the cysts are sterile cysts so they are not going to propagate and even if the dogs ingest them and uh, the prevalence rate in india it is higher in cattle and buffaloes so you know these are sterile cysts are there and as the time advances these are sterile cysts also even if there are fertile cysts the protoscolesis lose their infectivity the cyst undergoes uh, caseation suppuration calcification then all the hydatid cysts may not be available for the dogs because nowadays uh, uh, in developing countries like ours the abattoir management has improved you know and we can witness that because we frequently visit the slaughterhouse there is a sea change what uh, you know it used to happen about 20 years back and now so a sustainable transmission cycle may not exist because of the abattoir management now one thing which i would like to emphasize here see when you are classifying zoonosis or hydatidosis i have seen quite a few articles stating that hydatidosis is a cyclozoonotic and that gives a little wrong impression because it is uh, no doubt it is alternating between a dog and uh, herbivores but as far as human beings are concerned the transmission route is a saprozoonotic route the way uh, human beings acquire infection of toxocara and suffer from visceral larva migrants in the similar mode in the similar fashion human being so you know saprozoonotic route should given more emphasis or more publicity so that you know uh, the transmission mode can be elaborated with a great reason vegetarians are more vulnerable not even not vegetarian because uh, the infection is acquired through contamination of the uh vegetables also particularly in a crowded cities like uh, bombay and even calcutta i feel on either side of the railway line the leafy vegetables are cultivated and if you know the dogs have a free access and if they defecate there then those leafy vegetables may contain eggs of echinococcus granulosus and if due care is not taken uh, the other day dr banerji has mentioned some of the kitchen rules uh, to be followed and in such cases also the infection can be transmitted as far as the occupational groups are concerned it is commonly encountered in farmers gardeners irrigation labor masons so those who are working you know close to soil so they have uh, more chances of getting this particular condition if the due care is not taken canine practitioner because you know the eggs are also present in the fur so canine practitioners are also vulnerable dog walkers dog handlers dog parlors so people working at these uh, stations they are also uh, vulnerable for echinococcosis so uh, what i feel you know if you want to project the zoonotic risk the dog survey should be done 
uh, that what is the percentage of echinococcus granulosus infection in dogs. But there is a limitation because mostly conventional stool sample examination or fecal sample examination methods are implemented. And in those methods, you cannot differentiate eggs of echinococcus granulosus from other teenage worms. So it is considered as a tinea eggs. Uh, so there are some limitations. Uh, there are certain copro PCRs available, but that is pretty expensive. As far as the economic importance is concerned, as I've already touched this particular topic, it is through condemnation of the infected organs, downgrading of the edible offals. So those are direct losses, which is more in cattle and buffalo because the cysts are quite big and the prevalence is also high. Then it is indirect losses due to reduction in the production and weight loss, very difficult to assess. As I've said, White Dental have done uh, fantastic work on this particular. And in that paper also, they have categorically mentioned that uh, the economic losses are also declining gradually. That uh, you can see these are all direct economic losses through condemnation or downgrading of the organs. In year 2010-11, the direct losses were 88 lakhs, 2000 something, and which were... Uh, reduced in 2014 to 15 uh, to 31 lakhs. So as the prevalence of hydatids are declining in this part of India, I don't say that is a picture all over India, but even if you consider that particular chart, that could be the trend. So corresponding to the decline in the prevalence, there is also a decline in the economic losses. So this was the paper I was referring, which is a very good paper. And those uh, who are working on this particular topic should refer these articles, a very, very good articles. You can get a lot of information from these articles. Now, strangely, interestingly, uh, there is economic losses associated with the human cases also. I was, I, I am not uh, fully convinced because here they have considered the cost of diagnosis, cost of surgery, cost of hospitalization, non-availability of that particular person after the surgery for a period or so, the cost incurred on the wellness. But in this case, the money is flowing from one community to other community. If, if there is a loss to the patient, then it is a gain for the surgeons and the hospitals and the clinicians. Okay, so economic loss in its true sense is associated with the livestock sector. That is my sincere opinion. So this is a take home message for the young scientists that they should note that the prevalence uh, and economic impact of hydatidosis in India are gradually declining with the time. And uh, there are a number of reasons for that, particularly the population of the stray dog is under control and uh, animal birth control program is in place in, in most of the places in India then even those stray dogs, when they are vaccinated for babies, deworming is done. Uh, then the habitat norms are now quite rigid and stringent. And there is also good control over illegal slaughter. I don't say it has stopped completely, but there is a good control on illegal. So this could be the reason for reasons for uh, uh, lowering the prevalence and economic impact over a period of time. So human beings acquire infection only through consumption. Even, you know, when I used to go out for, uh, uh, as, a, as an external, I used to ask this question, what happens if the fertile hydrocyst cyst is consumed in the advertently by a human being? Even a parasitology student sometimes you answer that human beings develop a hydrocyst cyst. No, human beings can acquire hydrocyst only through eggs of echinococcus granulosus. So what should be done? Yeah, the surveillance of the animal hydatidosis and canine echinococcus, echinococcus should, be, should be continued. When I was uh, contemplating of this particular presentation and going through the literature, I have, uh, I read at least four to five articles saying that this is a neglected uh, zoonosis. I don't think sincerely in India it is neglected because if you go through the literature, there are n number of references available. Okay, and even if it is neglected, I think looking to our socio-economic status and the other zoonotic challenges, we can afford to neglect 
this particular uh, disease. Of course, uh, monitoring has to be there. And then what I feel my suggestion would be, uh, we have reported so far four different strains in India uh, in animals, but there are no reports about the strain occurring in human beings. So those who want to work on hydratidosis, they should concentrate on these areas, the molecular analysis. You don't have to take each and every hydrated cyst you come across. The representative samples can be take, taken. For, while the, in case of human beings, yeah, each and every cyst should be subjected to molecular analysis and then find out which strain is there, by which you can also, you know, uh, establish a zoonotic link between the two genotype that is the uh, suggestion from my side that you should work it on that okay so it is very necessary to investigate the genotypes of human hydrated samples and it is as you all know a prerequisite step for a control of human hydratidosis so that is i wanted to share uh, with you all thank you dr vaidya and his team once again for giving me this opportunity to share whatever little is known to me on this particular topic. Over to Dr. Vaidya, if there are any questions, I will try my level best to answer those questions. If not immediately, then by referring the literature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for very interesting, very informative, and in detail, you have uh, presented your information, a very inspirational uh, talk, as uh, you can hear now understood. I know that sir is a very best teacher and very good teacher uh, now in uh, miss even uh, in a very simple way sir has explained the all details about this uh, genetic importance of echinococcus uh, and economic impact also because I know that uh, even uh, when we, uh, in our uh, department that's uh, outreach program on genetic diseases we work uh, three parasitic diseases hydratidosis, cystocercosis, and trichinolysis. Whenever we need uh, miss any guidance, so uh, we have taken from uh, Sir only, Sir has guided for whatever the work we have done and publications we have done, that is because of uh, goodness, Sir only. So uh, thank you very much, Sir. Now uh, I re request from the participants. Questions, please. Uh, even I also learned from this uh, presentation that uh, whatever. So, uh, uh, Dr. B.D. Sharma, sir, he graduated uh, in 1975 from Pantanagar and did his MVST from IVR in 1977 and PhD 1989 from the IVR in the Livestock Products Technology. Then after that, uh, sir, joined, uh, sir joined ICR, uh, IVR in the January 1990, uh, 1982 and worked as a scientist under ARS uh, service and uh, then he served as a senior scientist till 2003 and after that he is promoted as a principal scientist uh, principal scientist uh, till uh, 2014 till his retirement and served, served as a head uh, from 2007 to 2000 and articles and uh, authored more than uh, authored around five books in the in the area of meat science and technology and all, almost all the PG, uh, UG and PG students uh, from all over India, those who, who, who undergo this LPT course in the BBS, CNH and the master's course, uh, uh, they, are, they definitely read his books. So his books are more than more, they're very much popular throughout the India. And uh, sir has several awards and recognitions. Uh, he, he has, uh, he, he is the recipient of best teacher award I wear at Deemed University in 2004. I see a Dr. Rajan Prashad Award. Then he sir, was a member of uh, Board of Management of IVRI, member of Academic Council of IVRI. Sir was a member of Management Committee, Poultry Directorate, Hyderabad. Sir uh, served as a Vice President of Indian Meat Science Association. And uh, he, has, uh, he, he was the Chairman of the IVRI Board of Studies. And, uh, uh, and uh, sir, has several, uh, performed several assignments also, like in setting of papers in UPSC, ASR, several courses for the IGNU, Gadwasu, 
gb pant university sipet etc and uh, as sir, sir, sir used to conduct uh, this uh, uh, our course uh, when we were in pg and phd for the sensory evaluation so he has a he is he is the right person to speak on the sensory evaluation of the livestock products and uh, we have we have pleasure to listen to sir so uh, it, so now i request sir to start his uh, lecture thank you the organizing secretaries program coordinators distinguished seniors my colleagues faculty of various universities and colleges and dear students so i have been assigned this topic so uh, i will be speaking on the topic sensory evaluation of livestock products the sensory evaluation is the scientific testing method that evokes measures analyzes and interprets the human responses to those characteristics of the food products that are perceived through the senses of sight taste smell and hearing it is a fairly young science and most of the development and expansion have taken a place in the last three decades this is being used in the food industry throughout the world it puts more human element to the overall acceptability of the food products due to multi sensory due to multi sensory experience the modern instrumental techniques available these days can analyze usually one or at time two quality eating quality parameters at a time but almost all the attributes and the total impression of the food product can be properly assessed only by the human sensory perception the application of sensory evaluation is important in the new product development analysis of the competitive food products assessment and storage quality and shelf life of the foods the market level consumer test and aroma research there can be many more other applications the human physiology and psychology have contributed a lot in evolving the principles of sensory evaluation many times there there are sensory evaluation and organoleptic evaluation these terms are used interchangeably interchangeably but uh, they are not exactly same the sensory evaluation is scientific the panels that are participate participating in the sensory evaluation they are usually trained and the results that we get are op often reproducible or comparable whereas in the organoleptic evaluation the is senses are just emotional and subjective and usually untrained panelists they participate here and the results are sent up reproducible then there are there is a term called higher senses which is used for vision and hearing because they are higher level of sensory perception whereas the senses of olfaction and taste are used for the as uh, are called the lower senses because of their chemical sensing procedure and the time or and the sensitivity that it takes then these two terms sensory panel and taste panels are many times confused taste panel is a very narrow term 
whereas the sensory evalu uh, evaluation or sensory panel is, uh, is the proper technical term for the sensory evaluation exercise. There are four basic tastes, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Now they have in 2002, they have uh, confirmed one more taste called umami, which is savory or meat-like. This uh, umami receptors can detect the amino acid glutamate uh, that is generally found in the muscle foods. Now you, those who are familiar with the taste map of the tongue, uh, they can see that the the sweet taste is mostly the, the taste buds are concentrated on the anterior side of the tongue, then on the anterior, uh, uh, anterior side of the tongue, there are salty uh, taste buds. And then for the sour taste, there are uh, on the uh, posterior sides, uh, the, bird, uh, the taste buds are concentrated. Whereas for bitter, the, if they are on the posterior side. This taste mass is an oversimplification because the sensitivity of all the taste is distributed across the whole tongue, but some areas are more responsive to certain taste than others. A human tongue has 2,000 to 10,000 taste birds, and each bird has 50 to 100 taste receptor cells. These taste receptor cells are very sensitive and they get activated very quickly. So when the food comes in the contact, then they, they, it triggers a neural impulse in, the, uh, in these receptor cells uh, within less than one tenth of a se second. As far as odor is concerned, the inhaled air passing through the nostril contain volatile chemical molecules from the food, which are detected by 10 to 20 million olfactory receptor cells that are embedded in the olfactory membrane of the upper nasal passage. So on stimulation of the olfactory receptor cells, the membrane sends neural messages to the brain via the olfactory, olfactory nerves. Our eyes can perceive general appearance of the food, the color, size, shape, texture, consistency, etc. The light entering the lens of the eye is focused on the retina, where the rods and pons convert it to the neural impulses, which are transmitted to the brain via optic nerve. The sense of touch delivers the impression of the food texture. The textile properties of the texture, which are measured as tactile properties or the moisture properties are sensed by the, uh, the skin uh, of the hand, lips, or tongue. The sense of hearing can perceive the sounds like crunching, crackling, popping, etc that can communicate much about a food. The sound is detected as vibrations propagating in the air, which are transmitted via the middle ear to create the hydraulic motion in the fluid of the internal ear or cochlea. The agitation in the cochlea sends neural impulses to the brain. Now, what should be the requirement of the sensory evaluation facility or the sensory evaluation lab? You can see that uh, it should have the sufficient space with separate panel booths. The panel booths are must, they should be, the, the entire space has to be partitioned. It has to be a quiet and odor free space or the laboratory. The ideal temperature in the sensory evaluation lab should be 22 plus minus 2 degrees Celsius and relative humidity should be 55 to 75 percent. 
a uniform white fluorescent light of 300 to 500 lux uh, should be there in the sensory evaluation lab. Then in the analytical test, we need the, uh, the properly selected and trained sensory panelists. So these sensory panel members are selected on the basis of general health, appetite, sensitivity, willingness, availability, etc. They should be healthy persons, preferably drawn from both the sexes and age groups. The people suffering from cold or flu and color blindness, they do not qualify for this job. Then smoking has been found to dull the gustatory and the olfactory sensations. So the smoking has to be avoided by the panel members at least 30 minutes before the sensory evaluation test. Now there is <clears throat> one more representation of the sensory evaluation lab. The preparation area for the food products or the food samples has to be different because we do not want any flavor cooking the flavors inside the sensory evaluation lab. And this the samples that are prepared in the in the preparation lab, they are transferred by a pass-through window uh, to the central table. And from there, the samples are distributed to various booths, various booths uh, for the sensory evaluation. The panelists should never use the strong smelling substances before the, uh, the sensory evaluation test because the odors uh, get imp impaired because of these strong smelling substances. Then we do not invite the excited or irritated members in the sensory evaluation exercise because an excited person can uh, both, both the, these situations, they decrease the concentration of the panelists. The prospective panelists are subjected to the taste recognition test and they are subjected to the threshold test also. These sensory thresholds can be further improved by conducting the specials, the, the sessions, the training sessions, especially with the difference tests. Then, the preparation and presentation of the sample, the cooked steaks, chops, roasts, their samples are pre prepared at uh, of the size of 1.25 centimeter cube. The cutting of meat patties samples is done in the pie or wedge shape. The minimum serving temperature of meat is 60 degrees Celsius in various different sets because most valid volatile aromatics can be determined at this temperature. Then samples should not be coded like one, two, three, four. They are coded with the three digit random numbers. They are presented in the random order. Uh, we can see, we can put X, Y, X or A, A, B, C or B, A, C like that. So different digits random numbers are used. Then the size of this, uh, the samples, the, we can have only four samples uh, evaluated per session. And in case the experiment so demands, we can have a maximum of six samples, but not more than that in any sensory evaluation session. The pellet cleansers, such as the distilled water at room temperature or unsalted crackers can be used to minimize the taste fatigue or the uh, flavor carryover. Then vessels, the white glazed china plates washed in the unscented detergent, they serve best as the sample containers. The sensory evaluation methods could be analytical test or the 
effective test. The analytical test could be the difference test, the flavor profile test, texture profile test, descriptive sensory attribute test, or we can have the sensory spectrum. The effective test or the consumer evaluation test or consumer panel evaluation, it could be through the rating test and the preference test. Uh, coming to the difference tests, which are very important in the panel uh, training after a due process of selection, the, these are of three types, the paired difference test, the triangle test, and the duo trial test. The pair difference tests in this one, in this test, the two samples are presented at a time. The samples may be same or different, and there are 50% chances of the respondent being right. In the triangle test, which is also a very important test, difference test for the, the panel training, three samples are presented simultaneously of which two samples are same and one is different. And if the panel members are uh, advised to or instructed to identify the odd sample, there are 33.3% chances of getting the right answer. Then duo trio test is a combination of the earlier two tests. Here, the reference sample is presented first, followed by two other samples, one of which is same as the reference sample. The panel members are asked as to which of the two last two samples is the same or different from the reference. And here also, there are 50% chances of getting the right answer. Then descriptive test. These tests are sophisticated, flexible, and widely used tools in the sensory analysis. They have several advantages over the difference tests because these the test they describe and quantify the differences between the meat products and their sensory attributes. And one of the important uh, descriptive test is the flavor profile test. This is a very specialized type of test in, in which the potential panelists are screened according to their abilities to discriminate the aroma and flavor differences. Four to six highly trained members of a panel, they individually evaluate a sample. Then individual components of aroma or flavor are described in the sequence of their perception. Then the intensity of each component is determined. This test. The results are submitted to the panel leader who leads a discussion to arrive at a general consensus on the samples. The texture profile test is another important test, a descriptive type of test. Here there is a systematic approach to the measurement of the textural dimensions of a food in order of their perception. During the eating exercise or the biting, the mastication and swallowing. The product is tested in terms of mechanical characteristics as are revealed uh, mechanically to the stress such as chewing, hardness, viscosity, etc. The geometrical characteristics that relate to the size, shape, and orientation of products such as gritty, grainy, flaky, stringy, etc. Then the moisture and fat parameters that are determined through the mouthfeel, the that are greasy, oily, juicy, 
moist etc the panel in the texture profile test consists of the 6 to 8 trained panel members first they evaluate the characteristics individually and it is followed by the group discussion then descriptive attributes test the this is a comprehensive method of evaluating several quality attributes of the meat product samples at the same time so this is highly used test because several quality attributes of the meat product samples can be tested at the same time and it is used frequently in the product development as well as the shelf life studies of the processed meat products it uses eight or nine point hedonic descriptive scale for each attribute this test requires training on each sensory attribute and use of uniform cooking as well as product sampling is must uh, bring up out the best best results in the type of evaluation so this is a depiction of the eight point hedonic scale descriptive test here the 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 attributes are structured in such a way that for appearance flavor texture saltiness juiciness mouth coating overall acceptability in all the cases the eight depicts the extremely desirable desirable trait and one depicts the extremely poor uh, situation so <clears throat> we do the uh, sensory evaluation in this case uh, for several attributes at the same time in the trained meat descriptive attribute test the first sample bias can be an issue so it has been seen that the uh, some people think that the first sample can be a, a it can be the control or it can be a good sample so they score uh, it in a better way so the first sample bias uh, has to be removed but this they use a standardized warm up sample which is usually a sample that represents the typical product it should be used to the panelist at the initiation of the sensory session then the next test is the sensory spectrum it is an expansion of the earlier descriptive sensory analysis where the instead of the panel is specific descriptive, uh, descriptive scale the panelists use a standardized word list called lexicon so they have made a standardized word list called lexicon the training that is given to the panelist here is more extensive and the panelists are provided with the lexicons that are used to describe the perceived sensation so the panelists use a numerical intensity scale uh, which is generally a 15 point scale in this case then effective methods they are commonly called as the consumer panel evaluation and generally perform towards the end of the product development exercises these tests are consumer oriented and uh, these consumers are not trained but they are the potential consumers of the food product irrespective of their gender the age social or economic level the only requirement that we have they are the they are the potential consumers they need not be trained they have just to be told what is to be done in this exercise the serving size 
is standardized in such a way as to give the uh, right consumer eating experience. The serving temperature of meat products for consumer evaluation has been standardized to be 40 degrees Celsius. The consumer evaluation test can be conducted at the marketplace, grocery store, restaurant, factory premises, fair, fairs, etc. And the number of the participating consumers could go 100 or more. It, it is not less than 100, but it is always more than 100. These tests could be the acceptance or the rating test. In the acceptance or the rating test, the product is rated by the potential consumers on a scale of absolute liking or acceptability. The degree of liking is structured in the short ballot. So our ballot can have three criteria, very much liked, then liked, and if the product is not liked at or it should be did not like. So only degree of liking, very much like, like, or did not like. Then we can use just about right scale if the product is being tested for a specific attribute, just about right. In another test forms, there may be a paired comparison between the developed product and the existing competitive products on a hedonic or eating pleasure scale. This performa has to be as short as possible in order to avoid the halo effect. The halo effect is the effect in which the one, uh, one attribute is influenced by the other attribute or one uh, consumer uh, results are copied by the other consumers or they, they may influence the, the results of each other. So that is the hello effect that has to be minimized to keep the, by keeping the performer safe. Then another consumer test is the preference test. This is conducted as a ranking test where the various samples of the meat products are ranked by the potential consumers for the intensity of a particular attributes in descending or ascending order. So it, it can be used either way, either in descending order or the ascending order. This sample test uses large number of the prospective consumers. So 100 or more consumers are used for this test and data is subject to non-parametric analysis. To conclude, the sensory evaluation is a unique science which uses the human senses at, as tools. They are, human senses are used as biological tools and uh, in the sensory evaluation. If food technologists have to rely on the sensory evaluation, then the uh, equipment for the instantish, instantaneous uh, perception of the food by the five human senses. But there are several variations and the alternative methods in the guidelines suggested by American Meat Science Association, uh, their volume 2015, and American Society of Testing and Materials International. So if we go through, there are not many developments that are being take, uh, uh, taking place in the sensory evaluation uh, of the various food products. Several concepts are being reviewed, reoriented and realigned in order to derive the maximum advantages from these sensory evaluation tests. The only thing is that we need to apply the right sensory evaluation in a given situation. 
thank you uh, thank you sir uh, for your uh, nice and informative uh, lecture uh, we all uh, have uh, come across the several new things which we have discussed and it was like a, uh, a revision uh, for all of us so uh, thank you sir so uh, now uh, we have some questions sir uh, one of the participant uh, he has asked uh, that uh, which area of tongue is more responsive to umami taste right right so see uh, uh, this question is very uh, very clear but uh, you see the the section between the sweet taste and the bitter taste uh, is more responsive to the umami taste because there uh, we sense the uh, glutamate rather the chemical that comes into the role is the glutamate so that is the otherwise the uh, the taste map as such is an oversimplification thank you uh, thank you sir sir another question is there uh, how to select and train the sensory evaluation team uh, for different sensory profile mm -hmm. for example sir uh, that particular uh, uh, term is not mentioned uh, but he okay, has asked okay. see uh, <clears throat> can i can i talk Ah, yes, please, sir. Plus, uh, please introduce yourself, and uh, then uh, you can talk, sir. Uh, sir, I'm Dr. Sunil Kulkarni. I'm also a student from Food Hygiene Department of the same academic college, and uh, I did in eighty-one, nineteen eighty-one. And just I want to know how the sensory evaluation team to select the persons. Is there any list we can have for a selection of the person because all the things are physical health. These characteristics, how, how the person knows the uh, sensory or the profile. No. Example bitterness, for example sweetness, saltness. How much less? Because sometimes the product contains very less amount of salt, and some products can very high amount of salt. So how to uh, just the panel, or can we develop this type of sensory evaluation characteristic in a panel by uh, giving some training or anything? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, that's how I could understood uh, your question. Although uh, the voice was being uh, disrupted, but uh, as I can catch, see, we have to do the threshold test, especially for the various tastes and the, uh, for uh, the sweet taste, we have to do the threshold test with the uh, sucrose. For the uh, salty taste, we have to do the threshold test for, uh, with the salt or sodium chloride. For uh, uh, sour taste, we take the help of the citric acid. And for the bitter taste, we take the help of the caffeine. So these, and then when we know the threshold, the threshold level further improved by various exercises that we have done uh, several times. So uh, to get a, a then we can apply these things uh, in further testing on various sensory attributes also. So we can do very, uh, some eight to 10 exercises we can do with color and flavor. The flavor, which is a combination of the taste and odor. So for various, uh, see it is by training and experience and uh, Without much exposure, we do not uh, expect uh, very good results from the uh, panel. In the beginning, we do not uh, take uh, more than 50% uh, of the uh, untrained people. We uh, train them gradually, and in any exercise, 
at least in the beginning 80% of the people should be very experienced uh, test panelist then in the beginning we can just uh, reject their test and uh, rely on the experienced panel slowly and slowly they will learn uh, these exercise and their uh, their sensitivity and the threshold increase in, in a gradual manner thank you if uh, i could convey what i you wanted thank you sir uh, any other question any other participant want to ask any question uh, you can write in the chat box or you can ask directly to sir so i think there is uh, there is no question uh, so thank you sir uh, for your informative presentation uh, lecture and uh, a lot of uh, new information you have provided to all of us so uh, thank you sir and in future also uh, we request you whenever we have a uh, webinar or any physical training also so we would like to request you to conduct uh, one lecture two lecture for us so this is our humble request so thank you sir so thank you dr vivek and you, i convey my sincere thanks to all the participants and uh,